God's boundless diversity, we are all made in God's image. We gather together in this time and space, breathing in the Spirit's invitation to connect and learn and answer Jesus' call to justice and action. always with grace. Nothing that happens to you, nothing you have done or failed to do can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. We are grateful for the gift of our lives and the gift of others in our lives. Each of us is created with dignity and worth. We are called to love each other and to do nothing to others that we would find hateful to ourselves. We honor the many ways that people live and love. We repent for the times when our faith traditions have named lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people unworthy. Love does not exclude. We are all worthy. We suffer when LGBT persons are oppressed, excluded, and shamed by religious people who overlook the fundamental call to justice in our scriptures. True justice flourishes when we can live with authenticity and integrity. May we work to build a community where LGBT people are celebrated as full and equal members, recognizing their many gifts. We celebrate sexual and gender diversity as a blessing that enriches us all. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen.
A reading from Genesis. Then God said, Earth, bring forth all kinds of living souls, cattle, things that crawl, and wild animals of all kinds. So it was. God made all kinds of wild animals and cattle and everything that crawls on the ground, and God saw that this was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection. In the divine image, God created them, female and male. God made them. God blessed them and said, bear fruit, increase your numbers, and fill the earth and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all living things on earth. So it was. God looked at all this creation and proclaimed that this was good, very good. In the image of God, you created everything and called it good. In abundant diversity, your likeness is found in us. We reject all messages that belittle or degrade any among us. And so in faithfulness to God and one another, we proclaim. Sacred are our bodies of every size and ability. Blessed are our sexualities, drawing us towards love of many kinds. Beloved in every gender, revealing you in different ways. To our skin, beautiful in every shade, we say, Hallelujah. Praise God, our Creator, who blesses us with, with this world. These all created good. Very good. Amen. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. So I'm carrying a book. I'm not going to read the book, but I am going to reference the book. Um, so over the summer, we went on vacation to Door County, and there was this little bookstore there. And it's always really nice to go to a different place um, and see all the pride flags that they choose to display and to support those businesses because you want to. It feels good. Um, but this is a book, and maybe you've heard of it, but it, it's called If You're a Kid Like Gavin. And it's a true story, and it follows the life of a young high school activist activating, or activating, advocating for himself as a trans man um, in a high school where there are no bathrooms for him to use. So I thought it'd be fitting to reference this, talk about it a little bit in relation to this faith community that does have bathrooms for kids like Gavin. Um, in this book, it's not the church that is working against Gavin to have what he needs to be safe and to feel like he has a place at his school. Um, but in the past, it has been the church in some instances working against young men, people of all ages, who are in the LGBTQ plus community. So I think it's really important to recognize that this faith community is not like that. And while there are quite a few in the world that are still that way, maybe a few in Madison who are still that way, we're not here. We create safe spaces for people of all ages, from all identities and backgrounds. And how meaningful and impactful will that be to our young people who have a space like that to exist in for their entire life? That's something that didn't even exist when I was a kid, and that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> um, but growing up in rural America, I, I mean, everyone has opinions about what that means, and some of them are probably right. But I'm 24 and only came out to my family as bi this year. <laughs> so I wonder what that would have been like for me if I had a space like this to exist in as a young person. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> But it's been really amazing to see those spaces as a young adult, moving away from home, going to college, and 
finding a church like that outside of Madison, but then being able to find something closer to home and to work in a space like that, like, that's not something that, I don't know, 15-year-old Cheyenne ever dreamed of doing. Um, I think 15-year-old Cheyenne probably hoped that her parents would become tolerant to people in the LGBTQ plus community someday. Um, and now they are, because I helped them get there. But yeah. I think that it's really amazing that this place exists and that it is a welcoming space for all people of all abilities, of all backgrounds, of all cultures, of all identities. Um, and so I just wanted to reference this and say that it's an amazing, beautiful thing to have that here and to be proud of it. Um, because not that we can ever speak for God or like what God uh, actually would say, but I feel like God would be proud. <clears throat> like we love people the way that Jesus would and loving everyone who wants to be here or even people outside of this community just having boundless welcome and saying all are welcome is incredibly meaningful to people of all ages. So, if you would like to read this book, it will be in the MCC library for a little while um, and then cycle through and I'm sure we'll address it sometime this year in the faith formation curriculum. But if you are a kid like Gavin and you would like to read this book or if you're an adult and would like to hear about Gavin's story, it's a true story and I think it's really beautiful. A reading from First John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten of God and has knowledge of God. Those who do not love have known nothing of God for God is love. God's love was revealed in our midst in this way, by sending the only begotten into the world that we might have faith through the anointed one. Love then consists of this, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and sent only begotten to be an offering for our sins. Beloved, if God has loved us so, we must have the same love for one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God dwells in us, and God's love is brought to perfection in us. Please join me in the response. God is queer. As in strange, surprising, non-conforming to norms that destroy. As in breaking open a new possibilities, through flesh entangled through brave acts of collective courage. As in troubling certainties, resisting assimilation, and persisting through struggle together. As in interdependence, chosen family, and reaching out to isolated kin. As in always becoming, as in less this or that, and more multi-layered, multi-dimensional, and complex. As an intimately experienced and beyond definition, resist the desire to be whole and combined. As in love that begets love, loyal to love, lovers, beloveds, even when it's all on the line. Now that Cheyenne shared that lovely message, I don't need to preach today. <laughs> Good for you. Just kidding. All right, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. At our youth retreat last week, Pastor Nick scattered a variety of images on the pavement. It was kind of wet, so we were under the, the shelter there of the roof. And he asked the, the youth to pick out a few of the images amongst the pile that resonated with their idea of God. They picked out an image of a garden, a sunset, a candle, 
of a rock and a feather. Those I put on there, I see one's already falling over, and some of you can't see it because communion's in the way, but communion's also a great image of God. So I invite you after the service to take a peek at some of these images. Nick asked why these images resonated with their idea of God, and we had a really thoughtful, wonderful discussion with them. Unlike many of our youth, us older Christians wrestle with the idea wrestle with to get the idea of a white bearded man in the sky out of our heads and I do consider myself a part of that category this image oops, geez. this image look familiar to anybody yeah. yeah this Michelangelo's painting of a rippling muscled God reaching out to touch the finger of Adam is one of many images that have dominated Western Christian imaginations of God. Supplemented by words like Father, which is pervasive throughout the Bible, we fashion God's images to be like that of an old but strong man who very much resembles us humans. This image is one that we gave our youth the opportunity to choose from, and they decided that this wasn't their best representation of God. In fact, they decided instead it was the strangest representation of God. And if that's where our youth are at, then I think as a church we are doing okay. Yeah. Christians in general, however, are phobic to representing the Christian God. Instead, we often opt to represent Jesus, who is, we believe, God, the second person of the Trinity. God, Jesus is God incarnate, a real human representation that we can latch on to. And that is good, but we also feel within our hearts that God the Creator is so incredibly expansive, and our human minds search for an image that we believe best captures the heart of who God is. And to do so, we often have to rely on metaphors. God is like a garden, God is like a poor widow, God is like a sunset, etc., to help us conceptualize God and make God less infinite and more knowable. Why does it matter what our image of God is? There are many answers to that question, I'm sure, but the one that sticks out to me is a tricky little line in, that we hear right at the beginning of Genesis. In Genesis 1, it says, God created humankind in God's reflection. In the divine image, God created them. Female and male, God made them. We learn right away in the Bible that we humans are made in the image of God. And that means that if we want to learn more about who we are, we need to learn more about who God is. Of what image are we made in the likeness? And how we answer that question says a lot about who we are, and thus, who we should be. This question becomes all the more important because of how it plays out amongst a Christian conversations. We do a lot of politicking about who is the best image, representation of God's image, and perhaps the greatest amount of politicking is done particularly around gender and sexual identities. For centuries, the question has been around whether women represent the image of God. Although it says in the Bible that God created male and female in God's image, women have often had an inferior status to men in most purely representing God. Adam was made first. It was Eve who sinned first. God is male. Jesus is male. And for all these reasons, only men can be leaders in the church, for they are truly God's representatives. Now, in many traditions, we have lifted women up as equal image bearers, but the public dialogue has since turned its vision towards those identifying with variable gender and sexual identities. The focus has lasered in on transgender people, the argument being that God created only male and female, and so, as God's image bearers, we are supposed to fit into only one of those two categories. Regarding those who identify as 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, pansexual, and so on, the argument against them as image bearers is focused not so much on physical attributes, but on the idea of sinful behavior, that to love and to be close to someone of the same sex is a sin, and thus excludes a person from representing God's true nature. But you can see that the conversation about who gets to be God's image bearer gets ugly real quick. We start to wonder what else might exclude a person from representing God's image. Illness? Disability? Variation in human attributes like eye, skin, and hair color? Height? Weight? Shape? Does someone who loses two fingers in an accident go from being an image bearer to no longer? Where is the line in the sand? Some might say, well, it's not about physical attributes. If you lose two fingers, it's still okay. But it's actually instead about behavior. Sinful behavior excludes people from being image bearers. To those people, I respond by saying, okay, but many Christians believe that we are all sinners. And it's true, we all do wrong at some point in time. So does that mean no one is the image of God? Again, the question for me is, where do we draw the line in the sand? The simple answer to all of this politicking is that everyone, everyone is made in the image of God. That God is expansive enough to include all of our diversity. If God, in fact, created the whole of the heavens and the earth and every living creature within it, including all of us people, then why would any one type of person be excluded from being fashioned in God's image? Who are we to decide who counts as God's image bearer or not? If we begin down the road of picking and choosing who is most qualified to represent God's image, we will soon discover that no one is truly qualified. Our only path forward is to trust that when God created Adam and Eve in God's image, that we humans in all our diversity inherited the blessing of, at least in some way, representing who God is. Today we are celebrating pride and all of those who identify as LGBTQIA+. I'm sure you probably noticed, given the, the colors that we are representing today. We are recognizing and lifting up all variations on the spectrum of gender and sexual identities. And we are doing this today not only because most LGBTQ people are really awesome people and are worthy of being celebrated just for that, but also because in our world, we still have a long way to go, especially in Christian circles, in recognizing and celebrating the inherent worth and dignity of every person in their own unique expression of gender and sexuality. So today, we gather proudly to rejoice for the beautiful diversity among us. I love that the word pride has come to symbolize the LGBTQ plus movement. The banner pride to me signifies that we are meant to be proud of who we are, our bodies, our identities, our passions, our love. When it comes to gender and sexuality, we have taught each other so much shame. All of us, regardless of our identities, all of us have internalized some message of shame when it comes to our appearance, our desirability, our expression of gender, and our bodies in general. And pride says, no, I will love who I am. I am made in the image of God. God made me and said, very good. As Lady Gaga puts it, I'm beautiful in my way because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track. Baby, I was born this way. This reminds me of a story in Genesis when Adam and Eve eat from the apple and suddenly realize that they're naked. God goes in search of them and asks, who told you that you were naked? 
You can hear in the subtext of God's words, I didn't make you to be ashamed of your bodies. What happened that you are now ashamed? God didn't make us to be in a state of shame. We were made to be proud, to be unworried about being different than others, unworried about having a body. We are all made in the image of God. Upon this, I think we can agree here. But it doesn't answer the, or the question, okay, we're made in the image of God, but which image is that? What is God's image after all? I can be certain that I will never be able to give you a full answer to that question, but the author of the letter, 1 John, has one metaphor for God's image. Love. He writes, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Everyone who loves is begotten of God and has knowledge of God. Those who do not love know nothing of God, for God is love. God is love. If we were to pick out an image of God amongst the many options out there, I think love might be the best one we can find. I'm sorry to our youth, a garden and a forest and a sunset are really lovely images, but maybe they're not quite as great as love. If God is love, it means then that we were made in the image of love. And thus, when we love, we best represent who God is. Just as the author for First John says that everyone who loves is begotten of God. And isn't that just fitting? In a world where we try to exclude people from the image of God because of whom they love, the Bible itself makes the case that for in loving, we channel God. We show that indeed we are made up of God's presence. We represent God's image. This passage doesn't say that we must love only specific people. It just says that when we love, we know God. I think the same can be, or can be said to be true for when we love ourselves and our own bodies in all our glory. I like simple messages, and the simple message I understand today is that we are all made in the image of God, and even more so when we love others. As it says in 1 John, Yet if we love one another, God dwells in us, and God's love is brought to perfection in us. So friends, let us be God's image bearers today. No matter our gender or sexual identity or how much we get rained on, no matter who we love, no matter the body we were born into, we are worthy of God's love. And we are agents of that love in return. Let us love ourselves and others knowing that when we do, God's image shines through us. May we all shine bright and true. Amen. 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 All right, I'm, I'm going to join you coat bearers. Uh, we're going to sing a song that is in the bulletin. It's called Imago Day. This is from the Convergence Music Project. And Pastor Nick and I are going to sing this together with you. You have, uh, just a note about this song, you have just the refrain in your bulletin, but Nick and I will also be singing some verses in between each refrain. So we're going to sing it through once for you, and then you're welcome to join us uh, for all the subsequent refrains that we sing.
affirmation of faith. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life, and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that waits to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth, and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful, so to be the church, for the glory of God. We join together in prayer. Each petition will end with the words, God, in your mercy, and you may respond, you hear our prayer. Let us pray. Creating God, we give thanks for this opportunity to gather in shared worship on a summer morning in the goodness of your creation, like the first dew fall on the first grass. We give thanks for the goodness of your creation, for the rainbow's promise. God, in your mercy, Renew your image in us, O God, that we may trust and celebrate our own selves and love ourselves for whoever and however that is, in our bodies, in our spirits, readied for each of our relationships. God, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. We pray for your grace and embrace, especially around those who have been told or made to feel their bodies are wrong. Their sexuality is wrong, they are wrong. We remember also when this overlaps for, for people in multiple intersecting ways. Give them courage, strength, healing, and a place to be exactly who they are and to feel right and whole. God, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We ask for forgiveness from you and from the LGBTQ plus community for all the harms church has caused. Reconcile us. God, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. Encourage us in all our vocation of loving our neighbors. We pray that you make us bold witnesses and advocates at this time when LGBTQ plus folks feel under renewed threat from court decisions and regressive legislatures. Send your spirit to inspire and invigorate us as we strive for justice. God, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. God, who delights in creation and in us, we don't just pray with worry and fear, we pray also with your delight, so grateful for the chance to celebrate today and rejoice in pride. God, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. We pray for bodies who are suffering and longing for restoration and spirits looking for wholeness including Ken Maxwell after a fall and having surgery today, Don Tubising after his bypass and Nancy, Parker Huff, Jill McLeod, Elizabeth Utpaul, Deborah Green, Lee Richardson and all dealing with vision problems and those who are dealing with orthodonture and its expenses. God in your mercy, you hear our prayer. We pray for these of the MCC this week, Bev and Steve Davis, Diane and Ben, Doug and Kathy Johnson, Ken and Chris Johnson, Sarah Jordan and Izzy and Coco. And we pray for college students who are moving and all going through transitions, those beginning sports and preparing for school. God, in your mercy, you hear our prayer. God, you are love. In all things, you are love. Continue to make your love known to us and to all that we may trust you will bring us through our struggles and even through death to the fulfillment of your goodness of creation. We pray especially after the death of Denise Morshon Irwin this week. Fill us with your love and bring us all to your love now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share some peace. Thank you.
apologies to you. May God be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give thanks to God. Holy One, your strange ways, they astound us. Among the mighty, your wisdom is called poor. While others assert their power with force, yours unfolds like an invitation. You never resort to weapons. You turn from all paths of domination. Beauty and truth are your means of persuasion. Freedom is your promise. While empire shouts false promises of security, using fear to turn us against each other, you whisper things of vulnerability, of meals at table and sharing what we have, of solidarity and new life. When you, the sacred, took on flesh, you saw neither the thrones nor prestige. Though you were presented with every opportunity to seek importance among the elite, to the end, you chose the edges, making your home among the vulnerable, living in solidarity with the criminalized and despised, abandoning the promises of conformity. We hope to be strange like you. Strangers to all that normalizes evil, to power that corrupts, to practices that demean or neglect. Make us faithful to the peculiar calling of Christ, unafraid to bear the names of the despised, firmly planted in the confidence of your holy mystery, the strange love that calls us to fight with and for each other, and awakens us to the joy you set before us. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his followers, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray as Jesus taught us in these words or the language of our hearts, saying, Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil, from the universe, the power, and the glory of our souls. You are participating online. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And for those of you who are here, uh, who are our communion servers? Corky, <coughs> Megan, I would love two more, please. Julie. And Betty, okay. Uh, so we've got one station up here, one back behind Cheyenne and Thomas, one over by Colleen, so you can go to whichever station is closest or has appeal for you, and you'll get a piece of gluten-free bread, and you can take a glass of red wine or white grape juice, and then it, we can just put the glasses onto the tables when you are finished. Oh, there are baskets. Okay, good. There are baskets. This is for you. All are welcome at Jesus' meal. Please come.
One. We can give you thanks for this meal, that nourishes our hunger for justice, for connection, for a world that is whole. We long for so much more than taste. May we be relentless pursuers of your kingdom, until every body has its needs met, every body is recognized as beloved, and every body is treated with dignity and care. Are there any announcements for the good of the community? Um, there's a small erratum in, in the announcements. The Community of Hope Women's Breakfast is not on Monday. It has been changed to Wednesday at 7.30 at Hubbard Avenue Diner. Our celebrations continue with pride today. Uh, thanks all for gathering here. I hope the rain didn't dampen your spirit of celebration for pride. Uh, thanks to those participating online. Good to be with you as well. Later on today, continuing this afternoon at Warner Park from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock is the Magic Pride Festival. And we've got a booth ready to set up there. You're welcome to come and hang out and be a good smiling presence and just pass out some candy and some little cards that 
Kaisa made that say uh, that we're a good, open and affirming kind of congregation. Just to, yeah, just to be there and smile and have some fun. And you're welcome any of that time between 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock or just to stop by and say hello or whatever you like. But it'll be a good time up at Warner Park this afternoon. What? Next Sunday, we have another shared service. Next Sunday, we will be indoors uh, for the Boundary Waters group to share their experiences of their trip this summer. So a reminder of that. And also of uh, next Sunday afternoon, we say the Keezy Bird service out at Holy Wisdom Monastery. Uh, Two o'clock visitation, four o'clock service next Sunday afternoon. Um, just a <coughs> shorter term reminder, next Sunday, or announcement, next Sunday is our backpack blessing as well. Um, this is something we did last year, and it doesn't need to apply to only children who have backpacks that are going to school. It can be anyone who is a working professional who brings a tote bag to work. Um, but we'll have, uh, I don't know what they're called, the, the things that you put on your uh, backpack tag. Wow, sorry. Um, <laughs> we're about to play charades. Um, so we'll have backpack tags, and those are free for anyone to take of any age. You don't need to be a, a school-age person. Um, but yeah, that will be happening next Sunday. And then just looking ahead to fall, because I know it's summer and I'm relishing in it, but we are approaching September, which means the program year will begin. Um, and just looking to volunteers for faith formation and children's ministry on Sunday mornings. Um, I'll be sending an email out to the MSP group for those who have ex um, expressed interest in the past, but this is sort of my pitch to you, like please do volunteer for our vibrant youth programs here. Um, part of having a safe and welcoming space for children to be in is having safe and welcoming adults for the children to be around. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering in any capacity throughout the school year, in however much or little you would like to, um, stop and talk to me and we can kind of chat through what that might look like. Um, and I'll be here next Sunday as well so you can stop and talk to me then. But if you're on the fence and need convincing, I will do that. <laughs> and if you're on the fence and don't need convincing, I'll still try. But anyway, yeah, that's all. Just a word for the wise, if you don't go up and talk to Cheyenne, it means either Nick or myself will be coming up to talk to you. <laughs> All right, so just so, want to remind everyone that we are also coming to worship to give of ourselves and bring our offerings to our community. We do have a plate that's on the welcome table and you are welcome to drop off any givings that you brought today. But it's also a good reminder to to think about all the ways in which we give and receive gifts with one another. And particularly, what gifts do we have to offer those in the LGBT community? How are we being a community for them? And especially, how can our church be a community where everyone feels safe and welcome, as Cheyenne said? Okay. Friends, we have gathered today to be proud of who we are, of the bodies we inhabit, of the people we love. We can rest assured that we are all made in the image of God, and that we are the image when we love others, that we best represent who God is when we embody love, when love flows through us, when our love shines in the world. As you go out upon your week this week, remember to think of those whom you love and to be proud of being an image bearer of God. I invite us now to sing our sending hymn, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, which you can find in your bulletin. Let's make a joyful noise.
Go in peace, beloveds, and know that you are God's reflection. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen.